The topic I, le I left off with last time, I'll, I'll always say a few more, a few more words about climate. I, my goal in, in talking about, about why climate, uh, well, why, why putting greenhouse gases into the Earth's atmosphere will affect our climate, and it is affecting our, our climate. Um, it's obviously a big problem, and one that you guys will, will live, well, hopefully live through. I mean, you, you, it's, it's going to be a, a major part of your lives. This quick summary of what I said about, about uh, the greenhouse gas issue is, is that the Earth is going, to, is going to emit as much thermal radiation as it receives. It has to in the long run, because it has to balance the flow of heat in from the sun with the flow of heat out into the, into the universe, all by thermal radiation. They have to be in balance, otherwise the Earth's temperature will evolve to match it. But, that, but the, the source of the Earth's thermal radiation is not the ground. It's, it's an, on average above the ground by about five kilometers. And the result is that it's, the temperature up there is, what, is what's di dictated by the balance of heat in and heat out. And the, the, the temperature down here is higher. It's higher because of a natural effect that occurs in the, in the Earth's atmosphere uh, because of gravity and the pressure gradients and so on, things that I'll talk about today in talking about um, air conditioners. The, 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 the point being that with every, every kilometer uh, you go up in the Earth's atmosphere, the temperature drops by about as I, 6.6 is what I remember, uh, degrees Celsius. So the temperature decreases. You've, you've experienced this if you've gone in the mountains. You've certainly experienced it if you've gone in an airplane and looked at the temperature readings. So, there's a, so the temperature drops as you go up. And so if the temperature up there at five kilometers is in balance, is, is the right temperature to balance the sun heat in with the, with the thermal radiation going out into the space, um, it's going to be hotter down here by, what, 33 degrees. And so the temperature down here is about 15 Celsius on average. That's average over everything, the seasons, the places on Earth, and so on. And by putting more gas, more gases that interact with thermal radiation into the atmosphere, which we're doing, we're lifting, we're raising the altitude of that, of that balance surface, of that surface from which the, the Earth's thermal radiation effectively comes from. And as it gets higher, there's more distance between that, that surface, which is at about minus 18 Celsius, and where we are. So we live in a hotter and hotter and hotter environment. Hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, ask me with the widget or, on, or live, if, if, if not. But, but, a, but a few cents about the, about the molecules, the, the so-called greenhouse gases. It, it turns out that, that gas atoms um, can interact with electromagnetic waves. Uh, you see this, for example, whenever you see a sodium vapor light or a neon sign. You know, what's a neon sign doing? A true neon sign is, is, has a red glow that is emitted right by the neon atoms themselves. And the interaction between atoms and molecules and electromagnetic waves is a, is a rich subject that I won't go into any detail except to say that there are a lot of resonant aspects to it in the same way that, that, that there are resonant aspects to musical instruments. They have favorite frequencies. A musical instrument, for example, has favorite frequencies. And it, it loves to interact with sound waves of certain frequencies. Uh, whether you have noticed it or not, if you're playing a, a musical instrument, pick one. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pick a piano, OK? A piano has approximately 88 notes that it knows, that, that, that it uh, really, musical, musical tones that it really interacts with well. It's very good at emitting them. And oddly enough, it's very good at absorbing them, too. So if you, if you whistle, if you release the damper on a piano and whistle at it at one of its favorite frequencies, you can get it, you can get it vibrating. Uh, another exa better example probably is a guitar. A guitar's got four frequencies it likes if you don't touch it. You, know, you just don't, don't, don't adjust the pitch. If you whistle at the guitar at one of the pitches that its, that its strings play, it will start playing that. Uh, it, that string is not only good at emitting a certain tone, it's good at absorbing that tone. Anyhow, uh, gas molecules are like that too. 
the atoms and molecules are like that too. Uh, the, the resonances occur for reasons having to do with quantum physics, which I'll set aside. Anyway, that said, most of the Earth's atmosphere is, of course, nitrogen and oxygen. And amazingly, nitrogen and oxygen atoms, they do have their resonances. They like, they, there are certain frequencies of light they love, but essentially none of them are in the visible or infrared. They just don't care about infrared and visible light. It's, you know, it's, not, it's not one of their pitches. And the result is the Earth's atmosphere is, is wonderfully transparent, the, the, the nitrogen oxygen component, wonderfully transparent to, to the whole visible spectrum and on into the infrared. What about more complicated molecules? Well, water doesn't fit that anymore. Water actually has, has uh, resonances, things that it interacts with in the visible and infrared. And so water is, technically, it's, it, it contributes to the greenhouse situation. Um, it is capable of absorbing thermal radiation at ordinary temperatures and emitting it, but only in bits and pieces of it, because it's got favorite frequencies that, that it works with, the other ones it ignores. But we're, as we add more and more of other gases, it comes from the complexity of the molecules, mostly. So, so as you add water, of course, has three, three atoms in the water molecule, as opposed to oxygen and nitrogen, which have two, and they're two identical atoms. That, that's what makes oxygen and nitrogen so transparent. They're two identical atoms, and that's it. By the time you get to water, now you've got three. Life gets more complicated. They're not identical. They're, so, so it can interact with certain frequencies of, of electromagnetic waves. And carbon dioxide, same idea. Um, methane's even worse. It's got five atoms, and it, it has its favorite frequencies. Some of the other molecules are, are even more. So basically, if we could see in the infrared, so we, let's imagine we see not only in the visible, but all the way across the infrared, we would still be able to see through a room full of nitrogen and oxygen, no, no problem. But if you started putting a lot of water, carbon dioxide, methane, some of the more complicated molecules we're sending out in the world, too, it would get darker. We'd start to be looking through. It wouldn't be a haze. It would just be a, 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 a grayness. There, there, it, would just, it would start to absorb the light. You'd turn the flashlight up and see, to see people. So that's what's happening in the infrared, is that our atmosphere is getting darker and darker in the infrared. And as a result, it gets better and better at emitting thermal radiation. And so, um, so it's uh, moving that, that effective surface from which the thermal radiation comes from up and making us hotter down here. Any questions about this idea <coughs> or any of these things? Um, you know, it's easy to state the problem. The solutions, well, that's a bigger, bigger problem. OK, I'll set aside climate stuff and go on to talking about air conditioners, really air conditioners, and after that, automobiles. And they fall into a, into a, into a class of, of systems <coughs> excuse me, that, that's, that's, that is itself interesting. Up until now, we've talked about how heat moves around uh, primarily because of differences in temperature. So if you've got a, a hot object and a cold object, the heat flows from the hot object to the cold objects because of statistics. It's actually trying to flow both directions, but statistically, um, the, the the laws of statistics greatly favor the transfer of heat from hot to cold, not the other way. Um, now we're going to look at that more carefully. And we're going to look at it through, well, through the, through the framework of, of, a, of a field of, of science, I guess, called thermodynamics, which, you know, think of it, thermodynamics. It's heat, move, movement of heat. And the, the, the observations of thermodynamics are sort of interesting enough of their, of their own right, and they'll allow us to look at two kinds of, of machines. The air conditioner is an example of one, the automobile is an example of another. The air conditioner is an example of what's called a heat pump. Generically, it's a, you actually can buy a, a, a device called a heat pump. Many of you who live in the state of Virginia um, have houses or homes that are heated by heat pumps, where heat pump is the name of the machine. And it, it's, it's an appropriate name because it, that's exactly what it does. The, the concept heat pump, not something that you put a label on, it's just the concept of a heat pump, is a device 
that uses order, consumes order. It, it, it takes something that has a lot of order in it, like electricity. And with the help of that order, it moves heat the wrong way. It he moves heat the way heat does not naturally go. In other words, it moves it from cold to hot. So that's what a heat pump does. The end result is that it destroys the order that it, that it, that it consumes. Th that order is lost to the universe. And that destruction of order paid for creating an orderly system, a, a more ordered system. It turns out that if you have two objects that are at the same temperature, they have a certain amount of order, not much. In fact, you know, minimal order. If you move heat from one to the other and thereby cause one to become cold and the other one to become hot, that's more orderly. It's got, you, 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 you have changed the balance between the two. It, uh, an analogy, and I know I live in my analogies, it's like taking your sock drawer. Suppose you, you only like, I don't know, orange and blue socks, just pick at random. That's all you like, but you're, you go to your sock drawer having not tended it for a while, and they're everywhere. You know, you, you grab any, you, if you grab blindly, you'll get, you might you, get a blue one as often as an orange one, okay? So they're all scrambled. If you sort them so that you put all the blue ones on this side, all the red, orange ones on that side, a process that won't happen spontaneously, the laws of statistics won't, won't do this. You've got to do it deliberately. You'll actually be chewing up order in yourself to do this, and you will create an orderly arrangement. One color on one side, one color on the other. That's now more orderly. So what the heat pump is, does is the same, but not with socks. It does it with heat, with thermal energy. It pulls the thermal energy from, it starts with two objects, possibly at the same temperature, and it moves thermal energy from one to the other until you have a hot object and a cold object, which is itself an orderly arrangement and wouldn't happen by accident. Statistics don't like this. What, what pays for that? The pump has to use order from somewhere else. It consumes the order, which is, I'll talk more about the idea of order as, a, as something that you can consume shortly. Okay, so that's, so the air conditioner is an example of a heat pump. There are other heat pumps around. Do any immediately jump out at me? Well, we use, Refrigerator is another one, these, but, but it's really the same device. Um, dehumidifier, which is up here, is a heat pump. Anyway, there, there are other heat pumps around. The, the other class of machine that's interesting that lives in the world of thermodynamics is called the heat engine. Big picture. There are probably devices sold as heat engines, too, like there are devices sold as heat pumps. But the, but the concept, ooh, a heat engine is one that sort of does the, uh, the reverse of what a heat pump does. A heat engine recognizes that there's, inner, that, sorry, there's order in uneven distributions of thermal energy. So you've got a hot object and a cold object. If you, if you, if you give the, the heat engine a hot object and a cold object, it notices, ooh, 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 this is good, I got some order there. And it uses the presence of that order to take some thermal energy and turn it into work. So to, to undo the randomization idea that, that happens in thermal energy. That remember, thermal energy is, is so chopped up and divided, you can't really do much with it directly. It can't do work directly. But the heat engine, because it, it, it's working entirely with thermal energy, but it notices the, the uneven distribution, it uses that une, uneven distribution to convert some thermal energy into organized, ordered work. And an example of a heat engine is a car, a classic, the classic old-fashioned car. I mean, the, the topics in this class evolved year to year and so on. And back in the day, cars were simple. Uh, at this point now, you got hybrids, you got electrics. Um, I'm t so I, have to, I have to focus. We're talking about the old-fashioned internal combustion engine. That's something that, that, that uh, Henry Ford would recognize, okay? That device, burns fuel, which by itself is a, 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 a complicated story, approximately the wood stove story, and now you've got hot gas. It's the hottest thing in the car and in the local environment. And the car 
essentially the engine looks and goes, oh, oh, I got something hot, and the rest of the world around me is cold. There's order there. It's all thermal energy, but there's order there. And so it, it uses a whole series of, of motions to convert some of the thermal energy in the hot gas into work, mechanical work, it, it, you know, for, a force exerted for a distance and stuff, and it makes your car go. So that's the world of heat engines. I, I did say a little bit about the weather. The weather's all, a lot of it, the winds. You know, what's, what propels the winds? It's all heat engine stuff. If you unevenly heat the Earth's surface, you end up with winds. And the winds are, are doing two things. One is they're, you know, they're blowing around and moving air, but they're also taking heat from hot objects to cold objects, uh, which is the way they like to go, and converting some of it into work, blowing things around, pushing on things for distance, and making, make, getting work done. And yes, they're working entirely with thermal energy. However, they're able to convert it into work because that thermal energy wasn't evenly distributed and therefore had some order to it. Is that okay? Uh, can I tell the people in the back to hush? Yeah, this is sort of a chronic problem. You guys can keep the, keep the, the volume down. It's, it's, we've had visitors, actually, that come in here and go like, oh my god, they can't believe uh, college has become like this. Um, yeah, so they're, yeah. Okay, so I said it. Um, is, the five, is the five kilometer layer the ozone? And actually, you know, it's an interesting question. The, the ozone layer problem, which is still, I guess, ongoing, but, but, but largely disappeared, is a separate issue from the greenhouse gas issue. So 30 years ago, maybe, the ozone layer problem was, was big in the news and, 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 and public concern. And I'll say two cents about it in a second. This one, the current one of, of, of climate change, the, the increase in temperature, is a new issue. Well, it's a relatively new issue. I guess it dates back to about the 1980s. And it popped up. People started to realize, oh my gosh, this is real, and it's going to be a whomping issue. Uh, that's the recent one. It, um, people discover stuff at different times. So 1960, there was it, pesticides, you know, silent spring type stuff. 19, the, the ozone was, was about my, you know, my college career. When some of the people there, the chemists were working on that. So, and, th and you know, now we got this one. What's the ozone layer problem? The ozone layer problem is that one of the molecules, sorry, some of the, 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 the radiation, the, the thermal radiation from the sun, it being a very hot surface, pushing, pushing 6,000 Kelvin, it emits thermal radiation across the visible and out into the ultraviolet. And the ultraviolet, ultraviolet light, so this is sort of public service and tools for living, ultraviolet light is, in a, in a classical view of it, the, the view of, uh, that, that people in the 1800s would, would have of, of ultraviolet light, is it's very high frequency and it is very short wavelength. It's too high, it, it, so, so it's, it's the same as visible light except that its frequency's gone higher and that should seem like the whole story. But modern physics, modern being the physics of the 19th, of, of the 20th century, and particularly quantum physics, people figured out that light, even though it's waves, it, just, it travels as waves and stuff like that, it, it, it comes in unit doses of energy. It doesn't come in continuous energy. It's got, it's got, it's got portions, so-called quanta, quanta of energy. And light comes in quanta of energy that are known as photons, just to give them a name, so that's the name. And the energy in one of those portions of ener uh, in one of those uh, minimum portions of light is frequency dependent. In fact, it's exactly proportional to frequency. So you go to the high frequency parts of versions of light and all its relatives. As you go to the high frequency ones, the little packets of energy that they carry get bigger. And by the time you get to ultraviolet light, the energy in the packets uh, in, the, in the photons is enough to do serious chemistry. So, so I've told you, chemical bonds, right? They it takes energy to, to, to reassemble atoms into new molecules. Uh, they, they like to stick to each other, and when you pull them apart, you got 
pay energy to pull them apart and so on. You know, so sort of uh, you know, how much energy does it take? Well, most chemical bonds that are, that are involved in, in people, the, the, the chemical bonds of living, living material, uh, organic molecules, most of those chemical bonds are, are pretty tough. They're pretty, they take a fair amount of energy to break them. Uh, the ones that, that I, I can get on other tangents here, but we focus on, to, to break them, visible light in general doesn't carry enough energy in, in its little quanta, in its photons, to break chemical bonds in living, living uh, organic matter. Uh, therefore, detecting particles of light is, is a little tricky. We have specialized parts of us that are capable of detecting visible light, the, the, the little packets of energy from visible light. They're in our eyes. Your eyes have these exquisitely specialized chemicals in them that can absorb and detect um, and, 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 and basically tell your nervous system they detect it, detect visible light. Ultraviolet light carries more energy. So it's, e it's, it's well, it's easier to detect in principle. We don't, we don't see it because our eyes aren't specialized to look at ultraviolet light. But the problem is it's able to do a lot of chemistry. It can tear molecules apart. And so uh, exposure to ultraviolet light is iffy. Uh, it's, visible light seems to do no, no damage to us. I'm not sure that's completely true, but, but, but that's pretty good. But by the time you get into ultraviolet light, and the, and the deeper you go into ultraviolet light, the more energy there are per, is per photon, the more it can mess up chemicals. So it can tear apart ordinary chemicals, I don't know, uh, sugars or something, or proteins. Uh, but it can go after genetic stuff, too. So it can cause damage to your DNA and, and all the other machinery of, of uh, cell reproduction. And you run the risk of developing cancers from it. So expo long exposure, or even you know, exposure to, to the ultraviolet light is, is hazardous to your health. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, can be, it can be popular and fun, but you've got to be careful about it. And we are fortunate you know, as a planet and, and whatever that, that our atmosphere absorbs some of the ultraviolet light from the sun so that it doesn't make it down to the ground. And one of the molecules most important for that absorption Okay, how, does, so how does sunblock work to block UV rays? Sunblock, the, by and large, they're transparent in the visible, but black in the, infra, in the ultraviolet. They're absorbing in the ultraviolet. So that the, the, the energy that comes in, it, it's pretty easy to make a molecule that, that, that transmits visible light and absorbs ultraviolet light. In fact, most molecules do that. Uh, the ultraviolet light has enough energy to cause significant rearrangements of the molecules, and therefore um, the, a lot of them absorb it. A lot, of other, a lot of materials absorb it. Glass starts to absorb ultraviolet light, for example. It's not transparent in the ultraviolet. So if, you, if, you, if, we, if we could see in the ultraviolet, we'd see a lot of dark stuff around. The trick with sunblocks, I think, as best I know, is that they, you try to make them not particularly absorbing in the visible, because otherwise you look, you know, you put it on, and you look crazy, you look weird, um, and pretty seriously absorbing in the ultraviolet, but without permanently damaging the molecules that absorb it. So you can sort of use them over and over and over again. You don't want them. You don't want the ultraviolet to do chemistry on your sunblock and change it into something else that is either a not very effective or b hazardous to your health. So finding the right molecules, I guess, has been a challenge. So they. You know, they do a pretty good job at this point. So when I was a kid, there, there, were, you know, there were no sunblocks. And so, so people would just basically be, be putting on oils on their skin, which I don't know whether that absorbed much ultraviolet or, at all. It just it basically was just basting the turkey that's getting cooked. OK, but, it, but it's, it's being cooked not thermally, but rather uh, chemically, reactively. All right, so ozone, it turns out, is pretty black in the deep, in, deep ultraviolet. And therefore, having ozone present in our atmosphere uh, blocks a lot of the ultraviolet that would be especially hazardous to us. I, the, 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 the regions of ultraviolet are divided up, just labeled with names. I think the, the popular one, popular labeling is UVA, UVB, and UVC. And UVC being the highest energy per photon version, 
and the one that ozone blocks. That's, that's my recollection of it. Um, a physicist has a more detailed look at those, at those frequencies, but it's not important. What's ozone? Ozone is a, a, a version of oxygen with three oxygen atoms in the molecule, the trio. And it's got a kind of a uh, chlorine-y smell. It's chemically quite reactive. You can, it's, it is used, in fact, for cleaning um, uh, for, and disinfecting. It's used for bleaching paper. It's used for disinfecting swimming pools, if you like. Uh, it is destructive of, it, it's chemically reactive. And, uh, so it's destructive particularly of elastic materials. So there, there was a fire in this building, believe it or not, in 1993. Um, they almost lost the building to a fire in the, in the attic. And it was a stinky mess after that, that event. And they talked about trying to clean up, particularly the smell, and there were two paths to follow. One involved uh, the orange smelling solvents. You know how there's some cleaning solvents that smell like oranges? That was one path, and the one they took. And the other was to use ozone. And the ozone sounded great until they pointed out that it destroys all rubber and elastic stuff that's, that's there. It, it, it eats those molecules. It breaks all the, the, the polymers. And so we would lost all the um, there are a lot of rubber seals in this building and stuff for, for the, the experiments. It, was, it would have been a disaster. And people who have had their houses cleaned after a fire, for example, with, with, uh, with ozone, they have to discard basically all of the elastic clothing they've got, the, 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 the lycra. It kills all the lycra and spandex and whatever. It's gone. Uh, rubber bands break. Okay? All right, so ozone. It's a three-atom. It's a three-atom version of oxygen. Uh, and it's innocuous up, up, up high, down low, down low. In a city, it's considered a pollutant. But it's fine in the upper atmosphere. And it has a long life up there, as long as there are no free chlorine atoms up there. And chlorine's not normally present up in the upper atmosphere. But what was happening uh, in, the, in, the, in the history of uh, particularly the, the, during the, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, was the, the advent of, of modern refrigeration and air conditioning. So it's apropos for today. Um, they involved gases that were, that in particular, had chlorine in them, the so-called freons. So freon was, a, was, was used everywhere in the 60s, approximately the 60s. Like, it was like, it was like a miracle material. It was used, it, 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 it's a, the freons are, there are, there are a variety of different molecules that are the, where the freons, they involve chlorine and they didn't burn, they were good solvents for certain circumstances, they were great for turning, for refrigeration, they were wonderful for refrigeration. Uh, they were used to, to puff stuff, so all the styrofoam was puffed with freon molecules and freon gas. Anyhow, it's got, free chl it's got chlorine in it, and the freons would drift out in the Earth's atmosphere, and through a series of processes, they would have the chlorine atoms floating around in the atmosphere, and those chlorine atoms were, would catalyze the destruction of ozone. One chlorine atom can go in there, break the ozone. I, I, I learn and relearn and then forget again the, ex the, the chemical cycle that, that, that happens here, but it's a cycle. And the chlorine goes and it kills an ozone atom, breaks it into its into ordinary. I think it breaks two of two ozone atoms in, mo molecules into ordinary oxygen, and then it goes around and does it again, and does it again, and does it again. And so the chlorines in the atmosphere are, are a disaster. It took people a long time to fear, to realize that, that they're a disaster. They destroy ozone, and they threatened to expose us to, to ultraviolet that we weren't used to to, to being in. And so there was a, th this is one of these cases when the countries managed to get their act together and they basically outlawed freons across the globe. They're pretty rare now. They're still around in certain circumstances. This is no, the, old, the air dusters of, of the 60s were all full of freons. Um, this is 1,1-difluoroethane. This is a fluorine replacement for, for what would have been a chlorine freon. So and 
fluorine doesn't, do the, doesn't cause the trouble. So, we, so the, the countries managed to get rid of freons. We'll see whether they can manage to deal with carbon dioxide and its buddies. Um, clearly less successful so far. OK? Long story. Is, free, is a freon a liquid? Uh, freons and, and this stuff tra transition easily and elegantly from liquid to gas and gas to liquid. It's the same story I told you about with water. Water can go from, wa from, water can go from liquid to gas and gas to liquid in certain circumstances. So can the freons. And so uh, if you release them into the atmosphere and basically expose them to low pressure, they will evaporate quickly and become uh, gas. If you pack them tightly so that they're dense, a dense gas, now you're favoring the condensation into liquid, and they will turn into liquids. And that's part of the story of air conditioners. So air conditioners are based, they used to be based on freons, almost like ex to exclusively. Um, and now they're based on, on replacements for freons, which are all not as good, but, but, but the freons are just too dangerous to have in the environment. Before freons, they used, they used ammonia. And you know, you know the smell of ammonia, right? You buy, when you buy ammonia, you're not buying ammonia the gas. You're buying ammonia dissolved in water. Ammonia loves to dissolve in water, which is, yeah. So you, you can put a lot of it in there. But it's stinky, irritating stuff. And it was used as a refrigerant um, back in the day, too. And that was OK until you had a leak. And then it was just, oh my gosh, terrible. And it's toxic, so it's like, wah. So I did, yeah. I, I had experience with an ammonia refrigerator, or uh, air conditioner. OK. Air conditioners, the story of air conditioners. So, so I'm going to concentrate first on, on heat pumps. Set aside heat engines for the, air, for the automobile. So an air conditioner moves heat the wrong way at, at the expense of order from somewhere else. It takes heat from cold to hot. And just to wake you guys up, I'll ask you a question here. Here's the question. Am I going to get it? Oh, no, I've got no, I've got no projector. Projector's off. I'll warm it up and see what I go. So I'll tell you the question. If you, if you operate a window air conditioner unit, so you all have seen window air conditioners, and they sit in the windows, right? So take it out of the window put it on a table in the middle of the room, and turn it on so it's running. And the question is, will, will the, um, can I get this to go? Yeah, we'll see. Yep, there he goes. Will the room get colder, hotter, or stay the same temperature? So you're okay with the question? Window air conditioning unit, not in the window in the middle of the room. Let's see what you think. Get it started here. Okay. So I'll, I'll give you the 30 second point. Then call it. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Pink. The majority is not correct here. The answer is B. All right? And the answer is B. It shouldn't come as a, too much of a surprise if you think about it. You have put a device in the middle of the room that consumes electric power. And it just, that's, you know, what it's doing with temperature around it is, is, is complicated and un unclear. But at the very least, it's consuming electric power. And where's that power going? It's becoming thermal power. It's basically, you're just basically heating the room up with that electricity. The other part, the other activities of the air conditioner are, are getting nowhere. It's, um, that, that, that circumstance of putting an air conditioner in the middle of the room is, is like trying to cool your room by opening the refrigerator. A refrigerator is just an air conditioner with its own little room. 
So it's, it's an air conditioner, it's a, it's a highly air conditioned box in which you put um, foods. So here, here's the basic idea behind, the, behind this, this situation is when you turn that air, that air conditioner on, it does what it was meant to, what it was designed to do. It moves heat from cold to hot at the expense of electricity, particularly of the, of the order in the electricity. I would point out electricity is an ordered thing. It's equivalent to work. It, you can run electricity into a motor and make work right out of it directly, no problem. So, so electricity it, uh, is not thermal energy. It is, it's, uh, it's, it's got, it's, it's perfectly ordered. So you, you, you're taking ordered energy in and you're just chewing it up into thermal energy. The air conditioner moves heat from cold to hot and in the, the middle of the room that doesn't do anything. It moves heat from, the, from, from, from here to there, big deal. The heat just leaks around back and goes back and, and it makes the trip a second time and a third time and a fourth time. But in this process, which is getting nowhere, digging ditches and filling them in, it's consuming electricity and getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Okay, so you can't cool your room by opening the, fr the refrigerator, you can't cool the room by running an air conditioner in the middle of the room, and so on. So what an air conditioner is meant to do is it's meant to take, uh, you put it in the window, if it's a window unit, it's meant to gather thermal energy from the room and pump that heat outside into the great outdoors. It doesn't make the heat disappear. It, it moves it. You, uh, you, Energy is conserved for one, and for the other, it, once you've created thermal energy, it's hard to uncreate it. You can move it around, but you, it's hard to, to, to get rid of the thermal energy itself. So it's supposed, to, it's supposed to cool your room and make your room colder and colder at the expense of making the outdoors hotter and hotter. And that's how it works. So if you ever notice when you walk by an air a window air conditioning unit, or even a, 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 any of the air conditioning units, on a hot summer day, the air coming out of the air conditioning unit on the outside is hotter than the outdoor air. It's blowing hotter air. And that's a necessary part of it. Okay, to try to give you an idea how, how you can, how, how can you move heat against its natural direction of flow? And I hope you, you're okay with the idea that it's moving it the wrong way, against the natural flow. Moving from cold to hot, that's, that's tricky. It doesn't want to do that. Okay, that's why it's a pump. Okay, um, to, to pull that off, it works within the, 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 laws of, the laws of physics, which include not only mo laws of motion, but also laws of statistics. So here, so here are the laws of thermodynamics. Let me, let me give you an introduction to the laws of thermodynamics. They're in the book. They're probably in my lecture video and stuff, but I'll give them to you again. There are four of the laws, four laws of thermodynamics, the last of which I'm just going to leave. It's not, it's not important to our story. The first three are awkwardly numbered, zero through two, for historical reasons. Um, I will accidentally call them by their number, but rather I do better to call them by a name. So there are three named laws of thermodynamics, uh, and a fourth that I don't even forget it. So the first, the, the, the first one to talk about is called the law of thermal law of thermal equilibrium. And what it observes is that if you've got three objects and two pairs of those objects, when you bring them together, no heat flows, which is to say they're at the same temperature. The third pair, when you bring them together, will also have no heat flow. So if I've got Three, three bottles, A, B, and C. If A and B, you touch them, no heat flow. B and C, you touch them, no heat flow. You know for sure, without trying, that if you bring A and C together, no heat flow. They're all at the same temperature. If that law weren't true, temperature would have no meaning. It would be chaos. Um, you couldn't predict, based on any information, which way heat would flow. It would be, it would be willy-nilly. So it's it, it's an observation the world does, does have this predictability and simplicity that things can be in thermal equilibrium. Okay? Not a big piece of news. Second <coughs> law to talk about, the law of thermal, uh, the law of conservation of energy. 
secretly known as the first law. Okay, the law of conservation of energy says, and it, does, it says this in an awkward way officially, so I'm not even gonna worry about the official sequence. It's, it's that you can increase the, the energy in an object either by doing work on it or by sending heat into it. It's, it's, it's written in a complicated way officially, and I don't care. But, you know, heat out, heat in, ugh, who cares? It's basically you can add energy to an object two ways, one by doing work and one by sending heat. And that does have a, uh, a that was big news when it, when it was basically developed. Why? Because no one knew what heat was. Uh, heat was a mystery for, for, for most of human existence. Um, the fact that it's, that it's the same energy that people had already started to realize exists in our world and our universe, that, it's, that, it's, that heat is energy? Oh my gosh, that was a surprise. And some of the, you know, the, their, their stories about how, how, the, how this was developed, uh, people thought heat was a, was a kind of fluid. They gave it a name, they called it caloric. And you could put caloric in something and increase its temperature. But you know, eventually they realized it's just energy. And so the law of conservation of energy makes that observation official. Is that okay, everybody? The, 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 the last law I'll talk about is, is the one that's most important to us. And, and it's called the law of entropy secretly known as, as the second law. And what it observes is that the amount of entropy, and I'll define entropy in a minute, in, in a thermally isolated system never decreases. Whew, what does that mean? Entropy, you've heard entropy talked about just in common language. Entropy has a, a specific meaning in science. It is literally the measure of an object's disorder. What, you know, it seems, wh you know, why don't you measure order? Well, it turns out disorder is more interesting to measure. So if you have something that is completely organized at zero temperature, absolute, you know, perfect, it's got no disorder at all. You can get down to zero entropy. As soon as you start doing anything to it, you break it, you heat it up, you, 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 you scramble the parts in some way, now it's got more disorder, and therefore the measure of its disorder, its entropy increases. Okay? So, if I start with, a, 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 let's go back to my deck of cards, a brand new deck of cards, highly ordered, right? It's ace through king, all, five, all four suits, no problem. That is a low disorder arrangement, setting aside temperature and stuff. It's, it's, just, it's, it's got very low entropy, and if you drop that, it's going to get messed up, right? Scramble it, bring it back together. Its disorder will have increased. It will have more entropy than it had before. And what the law of entropy says that is that in a, in a thermally isolated system where you've, you've built a wa walls around the mental walls, conceptual walls, around the system you're paying attention to, and I'll tell you why you need to put those walls up, everything that they do in there is gonna make more and more and more and more disorder. And you kind of know this from experience, that if you, you put someone, lock somebody in their, in their dorm room for a week, it's not going to be as neat and tidy as it was before. Um, okay, they can go around, they can organize stuff, but they will become more disordered as a result. They will use their order to order the, the room. But things get more, tend to more disorder, and it's just universal in the world around us. You, 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 you put the leaves, you rake all your leaves, your neighbor doesn't, the wind comes, whoo, and now you've got 50-50. You both have leaves again. Uh, it doesn't go the other way. It, this is driven by statistics. The chances that you, that you and your neighbor both have equal amounts of leaves, the wind comes along, without, not an orderly wind, but just swirling wind, and that miraculously you have no leaves and your neighbor has all of your old leaves, that doesn't happen. It tends towards randomness. All right, why the thermally isolated? The, the thermally isolated means that you're not allowed to move heat across the boundary, which is to say you're not allowed to import or export disorder. So if, if my, my little my quip or, or analogy about the, uh, the dorm room, 
if you close the dorm room and let things happen within the dorm room, it gets more and more disorderly. If you open the door and let them take out the garbage, which is exporting the disorder, then they can make it more orderly. So that breaks, that, that, the law of entropy is limited to systems that are thermally isolated. But within a thermally isolated system, the, the entropy has to, I, would, I, I, I tend to say it has to go up, but it, at the very least, it can't go down. You can't get rid of disorder, but you can rearrange it. So you can move the disorder so that one side becomes orderly and the other side becomes neater. And that does happen, and that's what heat pumps do in effect. Heat pumps move disorder out of the room air in your house and, there, and associated with that lower its temperature at the expense of increasing the disorder in the great outdoors and thereby re increasing its temperature. So that can happen. And there are actually other ways in which, in which uh, you can move disorder from one, sort of basically from one side of the box to the other side of the box. Uh, before I do this entirely without showing you anything, I will, I'll talk about entropy more carefully next time. But let me, let me just show you that, that with ordered energy, it is possible to do these weird things like move heat from hot to cold. And I'll do it with this example. So this is, this is the world's most primitive air conditioner. It doesn't look like it should be, but here's how it works. The temperature inside this jug, the air inside the jug, is being measured by this scale here. And right now, it's exactly middle temperature. That, so that's room temperature. What I'm going to do is I am going to pump air into the jug with a bicycle pump, an action that's going to involve work. So I'm going to do work on the air, pumping it in, increasing the pressure in there. And it, if I do work on a gas, the gas has more energy than it had before, its temperature goes up. That's the only place it can put the energy. So, so its temperature will go up as I pump it in. You see the bar graph going up? OK. So I've increased the temperature of the air in there. It's the hottest thing in the room now. So heat is flowing out of the bottle into the room the way it normally does. So I'm ending up, I started with hot compressed air inside there, high, hot, dense air. Now it's getting to be room temperature, but dense air. And it, it's sneaking. This thing leaks. OK, so let me get, I, I pump it in there again. What I want to do, I'm going to pop the bottle open. And when that happens, the air inside is going to push out. It's high pressure. And when it pushes out, it'll do work on the surrounding air. And its temperature will drop. It's cold. It's now the coldest thing in the room. And, air, and heat is flowing into it. So let me, is it, I, I showed you, if I, if I compress air, the temperature goes up. If I decompress air, let it expand, its temperature goes down. I've told you this sort of thing happens in the Earth's atmosphere. If you go up, if you go up the temperature drops because the pressure drops. If you come down, the, it gets, the temperature rises because the pressure goes, rises. But, but let, me, let me do the world's simplest air conditioner. This is just a sealed bottle of air. If I squish it, which I'm doing right now, an action that, that involved me doing work on it, its temperature went up because I, I, I added energy to it. It's now the hottest thing in the room. Heat's flowing out into the room right now. The, the, the good old fashioned way, heat flows from hot to cold. I now go into a room I want an air conditioner over here. This is the room I want to cool. And I uncompress it. I let it do work on me and its temperature drops. It's now the coldest thing in this room and it soaks up thermal energy from, this, from, the air condition, from the room I'm air conditioning. I bring it back over here and I squeeze it again. And it's almost like wringing out a sponge. Heat flows out of it because its temperature rises and heat flows out of it. And then I go over here and let it expand and cool and it soaks up heat, it gets cold. So this is getting colder each time I do this and this is getting hotter each time I do it. Each time I squeeze it gets hotter, each time I unsqueeze it gets colder. And so you can, I'm moving heat. I'm, I'm picking it up over here, and then I'm releasing it over here. And this is happening. So I'm, I'm making a colder, colder object, colder location, colder, and a hotter object, hotter. That's tricky. That's not the way heat normally wants to go. The cost of doing this is I'm consuming chemical potential energy and 
doing work, and where does my work go? It becomes thermal energy. I'm actually dropping off more thermal energy here, in this part of the room, than I absorbed over here. I pick, up, I pick 100 units up over here. I release 120 units over here. I pick up another 100, release 120. I'm, the net thermal energy in the world is going up, and with it, the entropy of the world. But I'm redistributing it. So that's the basic concept behind an air conditioner. I'll do it in, you know, flesh it out properly on uh, Monday.